Okay, welcome back to session two of the significance of metaphor in the Bible, figurative versus literal language. So my name is Frank Spear. Let me welcome you to this course entitled The Significance of Metaphor in the Bible, Figurative versus Literal Language. I am a native New Jerseyan, a former pastor of 15 years, a Bible student for over 25 years. I want to start by offering a thought, something for you to think about as you're studying this course and as you're studying theology in general. Even though the Bible, the Old and New Testaments, were codified, that is, put together in their final form, the Old and New Testament together, about 1,600 years ago, the Bible in a very real sense is only some 400 years old for most people. Now, what I mean is this, it was not available to the masses in their own language until the time of the Reformation, the later part of the Reformation. So in reality, in-depth Bible study is a fairly young science, a fairly young discipline. And when you include the advent of the internet, somewhere in the mid-90s, only about 15 years ago, uh, and you include the influx of excellent Bible study tools that came along with the internet, you know, that are free uh, software, uh, shareware available to, to, the, to millions all over the globe, then the time frame for the serious contemplation uh, and discussion of the Bible all over the globe shrinks even more. So the bottom line is in-depth Bible study by, from people all over the world has not been going on for a very long time. So I say that to make a point. It shouldn't surprise us that students of the Bible today, theologians, are shedding so much more light on the scriptures today, on the original meaning of scripture. Because now, so more many questions are being asked. And when questions are asked, answers are sought. And when answers are found, conclusions are drawn. And when conclusions are drawn, uh, differences arise, right? We can't help that. And when differences arise, then debate takes place. And when debate takes place, we're all forced to think harder. And I know that things can seem a bit confusing at times when it comes to theology. No, no question about that. We are all the time coming to a greater understanding of truth. We are growing, as the scripture says, in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a reason that the word grace comes before knowledge in that passage, because the more we understand things, the more we think we understand things better, the more grace we're going to need in order to deal with our differences and our differing conclusions. And it's okay to differ on the secondary issues of Christianity. We're not talking about differing here on the deity of Jesus Christ or the Trinity or the salvation that's to be found in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, we're talking about what I, I like to term peripheral doctrines. You know, you throw a pebble into the water and concentric circles form, right? And they spread out throughout the water. And the further away those circles get from the original uh, drop of the rock, the weaker and weaker they are. And so there are lots of Bible doctrines. Take, for example, speaking in tongues. To me, whether or not someone believes you can speak in tongues today or you should speak in tongues today is not a fundamental foundational doctrine of the Christian faith. I'm not going to part ways uh, with a brother or sister in Christ over an issue like that. I would definitely part ways over the issue of the deity of Christ. If someone says to me, I do not believe Jesus Christ was God, well, now we're not talking about Christianity anymore. That's something to think about, how long we've actually had this Bible in the hands of the masses around the globe, and how long the masses have been allowed to study that, because before the Reformation, the Catholic Church kept the Bible chained up, locked up, locked away, written in Latin for nobody to uh, look at or study uh, unless you were a priest and spoke Latin for the most part. And so uh, we have to keep this in mind. 
when people ask the questions, well, could the church, can the church have had any it wrong for all these years? And, you know, when we're discovering new ways to view a particular doctrine, what did the church miss it all these years? Uh, yeah, that's very possible. The church did not have the scriptures by and large. The Catholic church did, but the Bible was not available in the common tongue for most people. And remember, most people couldn't even read or write back in those days, in the, in the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, and before. So if they had a Bible in their own language, they would probably would not have been able to read, read it and study it anyway. And so it's a, it's a new world we live in, in a very real sense, in this 20th and 21st century, uh, especially. So having said that, in this session, we're going to begin to explore the Bible's use of apocalyptic language, that is, end-of-the-world language, or better, end-of-the-age language. Now, the Greek word apocalypsis means to lift the veil off something. It's a revealing of something that was previously hidden or kept secret. It's a manifestation of something. It can even be termed a coming. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, it says this, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, they're awaiting his coming, that coming that he promised. He says, awaiting eagerly the revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling, the revealing, the manifestation of Jesus or the coming of Jesus in a way that would manifest him or reveal him as something other than what he was when he was among them, okay? King of kings and Lord of lords, right? There's a big difference between the baby Jesus in the manger and the Jesus who was the young man who walked and talked among the people of Galilee and taught them and the Jesus who went to the cross. There's a big difference between that Jesus and the Jesus who is now King of kings and Lord of lords, ruling over, reigning over the entire mass of humanity, now, the word revelation in the book of Revelation is literally the apocalypsis, right? So instead of the revelation or the book of the revelation, we could call it the book of the apocalypsis or simply the apocalypsis. Now, very interestingly, the book of Revelation begins with the following words. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must shortly take place. Now we could read it this way in light of the original Greek word, the unveiling, the revealing, the manifestation, the coming of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants the things which must shortly take place. So the book of Revelation is about the unveiling, the revealing of Jesus Christ in his now state as ruler, the one who has dominion over all things, all peoples. Jesus is the second and last Adam. Okay, that's what he came to gain and establish. That's what the book of Revelation is all about when he brings to an end or brought to an end in that first century, the old covenant having to do with centered on national ethnic Israel in that particular local geographical spot in Palestine on planet earth. He came to do away with that old Judaic system and institute inaugurate his global kingdom that would have no end where he would rule not only over one nation and one people in one geographical locale, but where he would rule over all nations. That, I believe, is the primary message of the New Testament or the New Covenant or the new contract that God made with mankind in his son Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Now, the word apocalypse has come to refer in our day to almost any end of the world scenario, all right? In, in the, even in the modern church and in popular American culture, the word gen, generally speaking refers to the cataclysmic end of planet Earth or the universe, material creation. But here's the question. 
does the Bible itself ever predict such a destruction of planet Earth or the universe? And if not, then what in the world is it referring to when it uses apocalyptic end-of-the-world type of language, judgment day language, impending doom and disaster words? Well, simply put, in a sentence, that type of language is always referring to God visiting people in judgment, in wrath, vengeance, pouring out his wrath on a rebellious people or kingdom. From the destruction of the flood in Genesis, in Noah's day there, to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, so much of the prophetic aspect of the Bible is taken up with an approaching day of the Lord. Okay, and there are many such days of the Lord recorded in the Old Testament. There's not one day of the Lord where the world as we know it is coming to an end and some utopia is going to be established on the planet. I used to teach that. I used to believe that. The problem is when I began to study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation systematically and in large chunks, as I recommended to you in the first session, the Bible itself began to dismantle my premillennial dispensational bias paradigm. The model began to crumble underneath the weight of the scriptures itself. So there are many days of the Lord recorded throughout the Old Testament. And the more and more you read and study the Old Testament, the more obvious that will become to you. Those things will jump out at you over and again. Now, when we're talking about these days of the Lord, depending upon the context, could be either very near or very far off. The writers generally let us know the time frame of the coming judgments, these impending judgments of the Lord. Sometimes they're very near, sometimes they're far away. But when it does come, it's coming with a vengeance. Okay, that's the point. God has had it up to here at this point with a specific nation, had it up to here, so to speak. Hey, I had it up to here with you. Okay, when God got, gets to that point or has gotten to that point with a people, and he was about to punish those people for their rebellion against him, the Bible calls this the day of the Lord, or a day of the Lord. So he, God has let things go as far as he's about to let things go with the people, as far as he's willing to let them go, and now it's time to put a stop to their rebellion, to their offenses against Almighty God. That is what the apocalyptic, metaphorical, earth-ending type of language in the Bible is all about. Now, what exactly does this language sound like? What's the vocabulary of this language? What's the phraseology of this language of destruction upon a kingdom or upon a people? Well, first and foremost, it's drenched with metaphor, figures of speech, idioms. It's drenched with it's raining cats and dogs type of language, when in reality, it's never rained cats and dogs in the history of humanity. Okay, and it never will. Okay, so uh, apocalyptic language is very much idiomatic, very much uh, hy hyperbolic poetry. Okay, so let's look at some specific passages here, and I'm going to actually have an open Bible with me, so you'll hear me flipping around to particular passages as we take a look at them. Okay, now let's look at the language in the Hebrew prophets of the Old Testament. We're looking at Genesis chapter 37. And this is Joseph's dream. And here we're picking up in verse 9. Now, Joseph had another dream and related it to his brothers and said, I have had another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. He related this dream to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've had? Do you mean to tell me that I and your mother and your brothers will actually come and bow ourselves before you to the ground? Well, well, wait a minute here. Did Joseph say anything about his father and mother and his siblings bowing down to him? He said sun, moon, and stars. You know, what is his father talking about here? <laughs> okay, what is Jacob? Where does Jacob get this idea? Well, it's the metaphor of Joseph's dream. In Joseph's dream, the sun and the moon and the stars were representative of his family members. 
the sun, moon, and stars become a representative picture of the nation of Israel all throughout the scripture. Now, that's important for us to know, and it's no wonder that it comes to us right at the beginning of the Bible. See, this is why we have to start at the beginning when we're studying the scriptures and not say, wow, I've just become a Christian. Let me try to figure out the book of Revelation. Or let me try to understand what Jesus is saying in all of his prophecy by starting in Matthew. No, 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 no. The Old Testament, especially the prophets, are the map key, are the secret way of decoding, if you will, the New Testament. And unless we have a really, really, really good grasp on the old, uh, we better not try to interpret the new because we're going to get lost and we're going to lead ourselves and others astray. So here we see right from the get-go this use of metaphor. Now, admittedly here it's in a dream, but nevertheless, very often the prophets when prophesying are seeing visions. They're prophesying about what they're seeing in a vision or a dream. The book of Revelation is John seeing a series of visions. So metaphor is the way that God has always chosen to communicate with his people with his prophets especially. This is why this course is entitled The Significance of Metaphor in the Bible. It is highly significant. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel chapter 22. I'm just going to start reading from verse 1. And David spoke the words of this song. This is a song. David spoke the lyrics of this song to the Lord. In the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Okay, so David tells us right here in the first verse that he's singing a song to God that he wrote in celebration of God delivering David from the hand of the wicked king Saul and David's other enemies. Okay, now listen to the language that David chooses. Remember, David is a Hebrew. David is a prophet as well as a king. Listen to the language of the song he wrote. He said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, my savior. You save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies for the waves of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords or the ropes of Sheol, that is the grave, the, the ropes of the grave surrounded me and the snares, the traps of death confronted me. So in my distress, I called upon the Lord. Yes, I cried to my God and from his temple, he heard my voice and my cry for help came into his ears. Now catch this, verse eight. Then once the Lord heard me, right? Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of heaven were trembling and were shaken because God was angry. Smoke went out from his nostrils, fire from his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by the fire that came from his mouth. He bowed the heavens, he bent. He bent the heavens also and came down. With thick darkness under his feet, he rode on an angel. He rode on a cherub and he flew. And he appeared on the wings of the wind. And he made darkness canopies around him, a mass of waters, thick clouds of the sky. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows God is shooting arrows here and he scattered them. He shot lightning and he routed the enemies and the channels of the sea appeared. The foundations of the world were laid bare by the rebuke of the Lord and the blast of the breath of his nostrils. And he goes on and on and on. Folks, are you listening to this? David says, when God delivered him from King Saul, and we have the account of this in the scriptures. If we're reading the books of First and Second Samuel, we have this history written out for us of David being delivered from King Saul. There's no record there of God coming down 
and visiting planet Earth. There's no record of God riding out from heaven on the back of an angel coming to Earth to save David from Saul. There's no record of the oceans being split apart and God shooting lightning out of his bow and, and running off the enemy, right? What do the oceans have to do with this? What do the clouds have to do with this? Did God actually have smoke coming out from his nostrils and was he a fire-breathing dragon? Of course not. So here we have a wonderful example of the use of metaphor in the Bible, symbolism. I don't want to, I'm not so much interested in getting caught up in the, the details of the, of the differences between metaphor and simile and allegory. I mean, those are important and they have their place. But as long as you get the point that this was not language ever expected to be taken with a wooden literalism, with a strict literalism. Now, did God literally deliver David from the hand of Saul and his enemies? Yes, that literally happened, but not in the way that is painted here in this hyperbolic, picturesque, apocalyptic language. I mean, if these things literally happened, then the world ended. Because if the oceans split apart and the earth is cracked and, and all the rest of it, the world cannot be sustained. The material creation would not have been able to withstand that kind of an assault, you see? And so we have to take this language for what it is, okay? Flip over with me to Isaiah. Now you're going to find an awful lot of this language in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Jeremiah, in the book of Ezekiel, okay? These major prophets here. Isaiah chapter 13. Now, where do you catch this if you haven't seen it before? Isaiah chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, and here we're talking about the Medes, or Isaiah is prophesying that the Medes were going to destroy Babylon. Now, you remember that ancient Babylon conquered ancient Israel, okay? And 70 years later, the Medes came in and conquered Babylon, all right? And so Isaiah is here prophesying by the Spirit of God, about Babylon, when the Medes will come and conquer them. Now, remember, we said earlier, this day of the Lord language, this apocalyptic language used in the Bible, is used to describe a visitation of judgment, a visitation of the wrath of God upon a rebellious kingdom, nation, people, etc., in a, a specific local geographical spot on planet Earth. Not a catastrophe to come upon the whole globe. We never find that in the Bible, ever, anywhere. Now, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 1. The oracle concerning Babylon. Right there in the first verse, it tells us who this is talking about. The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. Lift up a standard on the bare hill. Raise your voice to them. Wave the hand that they may enter the doors of the nobles. I have commanded my consecrated ones or my holy ones. I have even called my mighty warriors, says the Lord, my proudly exalting ones to execute my anger. So God is calling forth one people to execute judgment upon another. Verse four, a sound of tumult on the mountains, like that of many people coming. Okay, a sound of the uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts is mustering the army for battle. The Lord of armies is mustering the army for battle. They are coming from a far country. Who's coming? An army. They're coming from a far country, from the farthest horizons. The Lord and his instruments of indignation. Who's coming? The Lord and his instruments of indignation to destroy the whole land, the whole earth? No. He already told us in verse 1, this is concerning Babylon. Verse 6, wail. In other words, cry. Cry hard. <laughs> For the day of the Lord is near. So there we have the time frame. It's close by. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp and every man's heart will melt. Every man on planet Earth? No. 
We're talking about Babylon. Remember? Every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment, their faces aflame. Here it comes. Now listen to this. Verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel, with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation. Wow, this sounds an awful lot like Matthew chapter 24, what Jesus was prophesying. When you see the abomination of desolation, Luke calls it the armies surrounding Jerusalem. God is talking about armies here coming against an enemy people. Jesus is talking about an army coming against an enemy people. Here the enemy people is Babylon. And when Jesus was speaking the words, the enemy people was Israel itself, who had become like Babylon who had become wicked like Sodom, who had become evil like Egypt. Jesus said to the leaders of those people, you're of your father, the devil, who is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And so can you begin to see some connections here? Draw some parallels. Now look again at verse nine. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land, the land, not the world, the local geographical spot on earth. This is concerning ancient Babylon in the Middle East to make the land a desolation and he will exterminate its sinners from it. Watch this. Because the stars of the heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will not shed its light. And this is how I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. Then he goes on to say, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place. But but wait a minute, look at verse 17. Behold, I'm going to stir up the Medes against the Babylonians. So you see what's happening here? Here we have again a plain picture of God bringing one nation against another nation And he's using language that seems to say on the surface that the world's coming to an end, right? The heavens are going to be shaken. The earth will be shaken from its place. The the sun, the moon, and the stars won't give their light. Wait a minute. This is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 when he was prophesying, not the end of the world, but the end of a kingdom, the end of a nation, the end of an age. So to summarize, Isaiah uses cataclysmic, end-of-the-world, apocalyptic, hyperbolic language to describe one kingdom destroying another kingdom, and God says, I'm doing that. I'm in the midst of it. I'm bringing those armies. That's why he can say things like, I'm coming down on a cloud. He's involved. He's causing it. He's in control of all the kingdoms of the world. So Isaiah, the Hebrew prophet, uses this type of language, and so does Jesus, the Hebrew prophet. He uses identical language. Jesus talked about his coming on a cloud, and he said that the sun and the moon and the stars would not give their light, right? The heavens would be shaken. There'll be a new heavens and earth because the old heavens and earth will pass away. Jesus is here using the same type of cosmological, planetary, prophetic language to describe the passing away of national Israel and the end of the old covenant centered on national ethnic Israel, the end of the temple with its sacrifices, the city of Jerusalem, the holy city, and all that went with that was coming to a close, was terminating. And Jesus said that that those who were hearing his words would be alive, some of them, to see these things happen. I tell you the truth, all these things will come to pass in this generation. And it did. This concludes session number two. Please refer to your student session instructions on this webpage or see your student handbook for complete details.